Thank you, Piero, and uh, it's great to be here with you and my fellow speakers and this fantastic room. I can really feel all of the art and science energy <laughs> bursting through the walls here. So, um, I am an artist, as Piero said. I, I'm based here in Silicon Valley. I was born in Tokyo and uh, spent my childhood there and at a very young age began Japanese brush painting. And the Zen form of Japanese brush painting, it's, it's a fascinating art form. You know, for, for millennia, it was practiced by Zen monks and by samurai. And interestingly, Japan's most uh, celebrated swordsman, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, a man who fought 60 duels and then died peacefully in his sleep, was also an extraordinary sumie artist. And not all, but many of his works remain, and they are quite astonishing. So why is this? What is this connection? I think uh, Sumie trains a calm mind and a steady hand. So there's this very interesting connection between the sword and the brush. And um, reflecting on that as well, some of these Zen principles of simplicity and immediacy and naturalness um, that are infused in, in the different Zen art forms. Zen has had a really tremendous impact on Silicon Valley as well. examples of this. Uh, so I'd like to show you some traditional paintings of mine. This is a, a detail of actually a much larger painting, but uh, and you can see that the negative space is really important. That is to say, the space between the brush strokes, what's not painted, what's carefully left, left out, so that there's room for the mind of the viewer to uh, the imagination of the viewer to enter into the painting, to interact with it, to visually connect the brush strokes. Um, and I think, indeed, here that is what lets the butterfly fly off the page, gives it movement. This is a, uh, one of my paintings of, of a landscape. It's in a private collection in London. And uh, this is also a detail of a much larger uh, work, a scroll of jazz musicians in a New Orleans Second Line funeral procession that I did after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and I have done many different uh, jazz, sumie uh, artworks and collaborations with Jazz Lincoln Center and with Marsalis and many other musicians. And the connections between jazz and sumie are like a whole other talk in and of itself. Uh, so I just want to jump into some recent works. Uh, after the Celestial Axe is a piece uh, that you encounter in the middle of the forest. It might be like what Edward spoke of as a mysterious, enigmatic event that you encounter. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be like that. And uh, the, where the piece is sited is on 600 acres of beautiful, dense, pristine California forest. It's owned by Carl Jurassi and the Jurassic Program. And there's about 40 other sculptures from international artists that are there. And uh, these are different photographs of this piece. My idea uh, for this was that there was, would be this um, celestial axe that would have fallen from the heavens, sliced this tree, actually in 27 places, mm -hmm. and as this blade would have receded, it would have left this frothy residue of reflective fragments. And uh, so this is a video because it really is a pa an artwork that is like a living organism. So it's great to see it in a video and you should uh, see it not only in photographs. The thing to, to understand here is that this is a massive, massive oak tree. It must be at least four times as big as this room. This is the widest part of the trunk, which is like uh, two meters across. And it feels like it's transparent. When you're standing there, you feel like you can walk through it and maybe enter an alternate world where the rules would be similar but different from our own. And you get this extraordinary blend of, of, of earth and sky and the environment and yourself. And some of the mirrors are parallel and some of them are multiplanar. And what I'm excited about is this idea of the environment uh, collapsing itself into the skin, into the very surface of, of, of the artwork through the mirrors. And there's a very interesting play of light, and what you can't see in a video is that if you are there, then you actually see yourself uh, in the piece, uh, and it's a bit like 
living cubism because you see you have like three shoulders and four chins and five different body parts, deconstructed. And I think that's why it's cognitively engaging because everybody sees it differently and they're trying to uh, reconstruct what is around them. And I think of the work very much as a platform work because people that go there, and I, it's so big and it's in such a like huge forest that people never know that I'm there when I'm there. So I can see what they do. I can see how they interact with the piece. They go around, they go underneath, and they take lots of pictures of themselves inside of the work. They take pictures of other people in the work. They take all sorts of different uh, photographs. They're constantly creating derivative works. So in that way, kind of see it as a, a kind of a platform work. And this again is the trunk and you can hear in the video a little bit of sound of the of the birds chirping but there's a constant ambient real nature soundtrack that's there if you if you go there and it's another thing is it's constantly changing so uh, in the morning to kind of be, to connect to your your talk about color and music in the morning uh, the colors are very different and the, the whole emotional uh, posture of the work changes if it's at the hot golden tones of the afternoon or if it's at midnight and you can see a thousand moons that are all scattered all the way throughout the piece. So I would like to show you these works that I have been working on called membranes. And the membranes I was inspired to create when I was thinking that I didn't want to create just a piece that would be like a static object that you just look at it and it just sits there and you stare at it. But I was thinking about how can I create something that's more like a, a, a tool for transforming the way you would look at the world. The, the thing with the membrane is there's actually multiple layers of, of mirrors in, inside of it, and it blends what is behind it, which in this case is the, the blue uh, pool, with what's uh, in front of it and with possibly you, the viewer. So um, you see this uh, blending of all of those things. And I call, them, I call my membranes membranes because a membrane is something that selectively allows certain things to permeate through, and uh, visually certain things are, are permeating through here uh, selectively. And it really is very interesting to see it in different environments. Uh, in, in a more foresty-like environment, you see it completely different. And it all depends on what is in front, what is behind. So this is a, a piece that I did called Thirst. And it's a bucket that has hundreds and hundreds of mirrors that are very uh, meticulously applied um, in an asymmetric fashion and there's just hundreds and hundreds of, of layers of reflections. This is a video that we took on my studio floor. Me, interesting to me to see all the different uh, reflections that occur when, when you kind of look inside of it. Also, when you take it, it's in my studio there, kind of a neutral space, but when you take it and you um, are point directing it in a di different environment, it totally deconstructs whatever that environment and does something entirely different. And I was thinking a little bit about how the bucket is very cave-like because there's these different uh, structures that I built, or you could say kind of like organically kind of growing almost from the inside, almost kind of like stalactites or stalagmites or crystalline type structures. So next I'm going to talk about the Tree of Pascal. The Tree of Pascal is one of my brainwave artworks, and I was inspired by Blaise Pascal, the great French mathematician and philosopher. I've been inspired by this statement that he made for a long time. I, I, I was thinking about it, so finally I crystallized it into an artwork. He said, man is but a reed, the most feeble thing in nature, but he is a thinking reed. And so I was thinking, what is the thinking reed for the 21st century? And a sort of answer to that question for myself was this piece. So there's many different views, and I'm going to explain the piece, which is really, uh, at the same time, organic, analog, and digital. And uh, you can think of the, the piece as a digitally enabled ecosystem. 
You can think of it also as the brainwaves of over 100 people working to keep one tree alive. So a tree depending for its life on <coughs> people's thoughts. So there is this prismatic-like structure uh, that I built and inside of many mirrors, and then the tree goes inside. And then there is this panel of electrochromic glass. And I have been interested in electrochromic glass that it has this property that depending on the voltage that you apply to it, it becomes transparent or becomes opaque. So to my knowledge, no one had combined that with brainwaves before. But I thought it would be fascinating to uh, uh, collect brainwaves and uh, then arrange them with custom software. Uh, and the, the way that we arranged them was actually in a musical fashion because I also have a musical uh, background and an interest in kind of connecting music and art. So we thought of the hundred different people's brains as kind of a chorus, and at any given time there would be one soloist, and meaning one person would have the most weight or influence on the algorithm. So all of those brainwaves are running into the system, and when the brainwaves are strong, then the glass will start to shift to becoming clear. And as pe people think less hard and their brain waves get weaker, then the glass starts to cloud over and become opaque and shut out all the light for the tree. So only when the, you know, the brain intensity is strong and the glass will become clear, then light can go through, photosynthesis can happen, and the tree can drive. And it's actually the first time that we got it all working. Uh, it really was quite haunting because you're seeing all these disembodied thoughts of all of these people from Mongolia, Africa, Europe, California, shifting and coalescing and uh, moving through the system. And then we also built this live mode where up to five people could put on emotive uh, EEG headsets and uh, their brain waves would mix in terms of influence with the existing kind of running chorus of brain waves. So, those people become like additional soloists in this Brandenburg internal uh, brainwaves. <coughs> this is the back of the piece, and these are paintings that I did. Uh, this, this side I called Conceiving the Universe, and this side I called The End of the Universe, and the top panel is called The Top of the Universe, and they're kind of inspired by neural and cosmic activity, and there's very interesting ways in which things kind of go underneath and around when you see the actual piece in person. And then I wanted to share with you this piece that I did up uh, for the first zero gravity uh, exhibit at the International Space Station that Kiros spoke about. So at a high level, this piece is really a conceptual portrait of father and son. Um, Richard Garriott uh, was going to have a, a, mi a mission at the, at the International Space Station. And when he was a little boy, uh, he wanted to be an astronaut. His father was an astronaut on Skylab. He never became an astronaut. He became a multi-million dollar video game developer. <laughs> but he became eventually a private citizen in space, so he did kind of fulfill this dream. And so uh, there were uh, several uh, artists that were asked to create works. And it was interesting to me all the rules that, that, that went along with this. Can't be this size, over this size. It can't be any of these types of material that has to be vetted, da 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 da, da all of these things. And I was thinking that space exploration is really about breaking boundaries. And so I actually created a piece that was larger than what they said I could take on board at the risk of not getting on board. But um, the way that I resolved that was that I presented the piece to, to Gary and I said, I would like for you to choose uh, a part of the piece that you would like to cut out and take with you in space. Therefore, there would be this celestial piece that would go into space with Gary. <coughs> And there would be this earthbound terrestrial piece that would never leave Earth. Therefore, the piece would be separated from itself at really great distances and speeds. And there would be this temporal sh shift and spatial shift in the, art in the artwork, which I think had, has never quite been done like this. So um, because of the special theory of relativity, the piece that went into space <laughs> is actually a tiny bit younger than the piece that remained on Earth. <laughs> because when this piece, when they came back, took the uh, piece and we uh, framed it so it's hovering and floating over the terrestrial kind of mission control piece. And uh, you have kind of one artwork that has contains 
two different ages. And I think that uh, this smaller piece coming from the original whole, that's why I say this is a conceptual portrait. It's really like the, the son coming from the father, or the child coming from the parent. And that's what space exploration is about, sending our best sons and daughters into the cosmos. these uh, pieces that I have been creating called Magic Boxes. Um, so the, the Magic Box was inspired by this idea that, you know, when you look at a painting, and I love to create paintings, I've created many, many paintings, and collectors love paintings, but uh, when you look at the painting and it's hanging on the wall, you're able to visually access all of it, 100% of it, all at once. But that's not really reflective of our, our cognitive process or how we acquire knowledge. You know, when you are learning about a person or something as complex as string theory or something like a news story, you get one piece and then like a week later you get another piece and a month later you get another fragment. And then with all those different fragments, you have to extrapolate across those gaps and kind of create your own canvas of knowledge. So the magic box uh, idea was that uh, they, the painting, instead of facing you, would be turned 180 degrees away from you. So the painting would actually have its back turned on you. And it would be tucked inside a box, and there would be this hole that you could peer into, and all of these different um, mirrors on the, on the back wall of the, uh, of the box. So the interesting thing about the uh, magic box is that you can never see the painting in its entirety at one time. You have to rely on what you just saw with what you're now seeing. And as you move, certain things get revealed and certain things get uh, concealed. And I think that that is more reflective of how we go through putting things together that we learn about. And I think that this is accelerated by technology, but it was true you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, it was true before we had all of these different proliferation of devices. And so I have um, a video of this piece because again, it's, it's good to see it in video form. The subject matter of this magic box, which is called Let Us Out, is uh, very interesting. I think um, the process is, was actually very elaborate. So I was fascinated by this idea of uh, entrapment and, uh, and stories of, real stories of violence and real stories of violence against uh, people all around the world. So I took this phrase, let us out, and I authored 60 variations of that phrase. Things like, uh, you, can, you can have her if you let us out, kind of referencing human trafficking. I'll shoot if you don't let us out. We knew it, you were never going to let us out. Our eyes are burning, please let us out. And I distributed those to uh, 60 different people from every block of life that you can imagine is possible. Uh, a doctor, a lawyer, a cheerleader, an entrepreneur, two prisoners, a couple of war veterans, those things are very logistically difficult to arrange. And then I had them give me back those phrases. And then I also took people like Einstein, Freud, Pushkin, Thomas Mann, uh, Princess Diana, and with high resolution um, le the letters of these people, you can actually reconstruct exactly how someone would have said something if you have like a high resolution scan of many of their writings. So I took all of those things, uh, the people that were some living, some dead, some famous, some not at all, some mediocre, some brilliant, and uh, took their sentence, which they gave me, which is like this long, and then recreated it exactly, but at very large scale, and in reverse, because remember, this is in the magic box, and you're looking in, and it has to be translated from being backwards into the mirrors to read normally. And so it's interesting when you see the piece, because in a way, it's like one big elaborate forgery. It is exactly the handwriting of all these people, yet none of them wrote or painted anything in that physical artwork itself. And there's a lot of different violations of expectation in terms of um, who wrote what and you know whose handwriting goes with what phrase. And there's a lot of uh, interesting questions that arise out of it. And I think it's also can be seen kind of as one one brain, one psyche, because you know every mind kind of has this element of the professorial, um, 
the mediocre, the criminal, the brilliant, like all of those things. And the, the, the let us out piece is really like all these different voices inside one box, some threatening you, some whispering, some cajoling, um, all trying to get out, none of them really actually getting out. So um, I'll just end really quickly with this piece that I did called Footsteps in the Snow, which I thought, what if I were to take um, snow from the top of a mountain in Davos, have like a child collect the snow and have her send the water to, to me thousands of miles a, a, away in, uh, in, in Palo Alto. And then I would use that water to actually grind the ink, like you saw the ink stone in the earlier slide, to create the painting. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a detail that actually runs through the ink painting in this piece that you don't actually know unless the story is told. Um, but sometimes I like to have those invisible elements in, in, my, in my works. This is a piece that's a painting of actual mountainscape uh, in Davos and a bridge uh, is kind of hanging over this abyss, going into the distance, and there's light behind it. So the foot there are footsteps made out of light. And when a viewer stands in front of the piece, you actually you see yourself cast into this footbridge, going into the distance, and you actually see kind of a very individual footpath, very clear steps. But what I can't show here is that if you're off to the side, you see many, many, many footsteps underneath each one. So there's this more collective footprints that you see, this idea that there's many, many people's footprints that we're standing on that we don't always see. So there's many, many more artworks, um, but I'm going to end here.